thank you very, thank you all very much for being here. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance for my voice. So if anyone in the back can't hear me, just start waving at me, um, trying to speak out. So my name is Jeremy Brown. I'm at Louisiana State University. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a few projects that my lab has been working on in collaboration with the lab of Bob Thompson at the University of Hawaii. So <clears throat> I think we all know that phylogenomic inference poses new challenges. And many of these challenges relate to how we go about sampling the genome and then once we've collected data, how do we just deal with the scale of the data that we've collected. But the sorts of challenges that I'm going to talk about today and that we think a lot about have to do more with accuracy. So we know that large data sets give us enormous power, and with enormous power comes a lot of precision, but precision does not always translate to accuracy. And so we are sort of obsessed with trying to figure out how we can make sure that the answers we get back from phylogenomic analyses are right. And so accuracy in the context of phylogenomics can often be broken up into sort of two broad categories. One has to do with the accurate inference of gene trees. So in this case, we're trying to model the process of sequence evolution. And then uh, we can also think about how we can accurately infer species trees once we've got those gene trees. So how do we model the processes that create gene tree variation? So today, we're going to focus primarily on just the case of, of inferring accurate gene trees by, by thinking about how we model sequence evolution. So to sort of frame the, the projects that I'm going to be talking about, we're going to think about model space in this sort of conceptual way. And so this black box represents all the possible ways that sequences could evolve. And then this red box is going to represent the types of evolution that we can actually model well based on the methods we have available to us right now. And so our hope is that if every one of these points represents a different gene, that all of these genes fall inside this red but of course, if this was true, we'd all collect a lot of data, we'd all agree on everything, and we'd all go home at the end of the day. Uh, and we know that that often doesn't happen. We often end up with strongly conflicting answers. Our fear is that it actually looks like this. And so this is what causes me to wake up in cold sweats in the middle of the night. Um, in this case, we don't model any gene very well. And so basically, um, there's, there's very little hope for finding consensus as we collect large data. In reality, the situation is probably something like this. So we can think about uh, genes being scattered in this model space, and some of these fall within the realm of those that we can model well, and some don't. But the question then becomes, what do we do with this? If we know that, that some genes are probably giving us reliable answers and others aren't, how do we deal with that? And so I'm going to talk about three strategies that we've taken uh, sort of within this framework to try, to try and tackle this challenge. So the first one is simply to identify when we're inside of the red box. So when are we doing well? Which genes can we actually model well? The second is to actually push the boundaries of this box. So if we expand it, we can encompass more genes from across the genome. Oops. And then the last, um, the last approach is to look for outlier genes. So if the size of these circles represents the overall strength of their phylogenetic signal, we can look for genes that seem to have undue influence. And often, it seems in our experience, these genes are genes that were not doing a good job of so first of all, knowing when we're doing well. So another way to frame this is as a question of model fit. In this case, we're interested in the absolute fit of our models. And there's a few different ways we can go about trying to quantify or assess model fit. One that we've used a lot is uh, posterior prediction. So this is a Bayesian way of assessing the fit of our models. And it's really just asking if the model we're assuming when we do our analysis could plausibly have generated the data we collected. And so more formally, More formally, what we're asking is, uh, could the sequences in our alignment have been generated by the trees and model parameters uh, that come out of our fitted model, that come from the posterior distribution that we've inferred using that same data set? So to do this, mechanically what we do is we use a process called posterior predictive simulation. So if we've done our Bayesian analysis and we have a posterior distribution of trees and model parameter values, we can draw samples from that posterior distribution. So here I've just drawn seven trees and seven sets of uh, model parameters. We can use those to then simulate seven sequence data sets, seven alignments. And this is known as our posterior predictive distribution, the set of simulated alignments. And then we do something that uh, superficially seems very easy, but is actually uh, in some ways quite challenging. So we simply take the data sets that we simulated and we calculate some number, some test statistic, that quantifies something important about those data sets. And then we calculate that same number for the data we collected, the empirical data, and we just ask, 
is the empirical data a reasonable draw from this posterior predictive distribution? If, it, if our model is doing a good job and it is a reasonable draw, it would look like this blue distribution. Uh, if it's not capturing something important about our empirical data, the posterior predictive distribution might look like uh, the one in red, and it might be very distant from the empirical. Um, now, one reason I think that a lot of us haven't applied these kinds of approaches in the past is because while logically it seems very straightforward, mechanically it was quite difficult. There were lots of different steps involved, and you had to move between different software programs. So one of the things that we put a lot of time into is implementing all of these steps in sort of a self-contained pipeline in RevBase. Uh, and so that's available now, and there's tutorials on the RevBase website if anyone's interested in trying this. So we're, we're sort of uh, constantly trying to add um, uh, new tools for learning about these approaches in the library. So to see if this actually allows us to accomplish the goal that we're interested in, we decided to use a couple of empirical data sets, and we chose these empirical data sets because we know something about what the true tree probably looks like. We have a pretty good idea based on multiple lines of evidence about what the backward amniote tree looks like and what, uh, what the tree for, for these 18 uh, species of yeast probably looks like. And so what we simply did was to take all of the genes in these data sets, apply posterior prediction, and see if we could rank them based on their fit, and then see if those that rank better based on these tests actually give us trees that look more like what we think the true tree is for that Now for the sake of time, I'm going to gloss over a lot of the details. If anyone's interested in thinking about how to apply these approaches in their own work, I'd be happy to talk more about it. But I'm just going to simply give you a thumbs up and say that we were able to do this. So if you rank genes based on model fit, those that seem to fit our models better give us trees that are closer to what we think the true tree is for these groups. And so I think that gives us some confidence that what we're doing is at least reasonable. So that's one approach, defining the boundaries of the red box. The next approach is pushing the boundaries of this red box out further so that we can encompass more genes. And in this case, we're not actually developing any new models, but we're simply asking of the available models that are out there that aren't applied very often, uh, can some of them actually help us? Can they, uh, do they provide a better fit to the kinds of uh, data that we collect in phylogenomic studies? And so one of the models that we've become really interested in is known as the covariant. The covariant differs in an important way from our sort of standard GTR class models. While our GTR class models, when we add gamma distributed rates across sites or invariant sites, uh, we can model rate variation among sites. These models still assume that the rates assigned to a site stay constant across the tree. They don't change through time. The covariant, on the other hand, models a switching process. So rates, uh, sorry, sites can actually switch between being on and evolving at some uh, faster rate and being off evolving not at all or at a very slow rate. And so we were interested if we applied the covariant model, could we actually uh, capture a variation that seems relevant to these, these empirical data sets. And I want to highlight here that most of the work I'm about to talk about was done by uh, two really amazing undergraduates, Lauren and Ashley, who've since moved on to bigger and better things, uh, as well as a postdoc in my lab, Lyndon Cogco. And so the first thing we did was to collect a collection of uh, recently published empirical phylogenomic data sets and then simply fit the covariant and fit uh, a more standard GTR plus I plus G model. And these bars represent the percentage of genes in each of these data sets that show strong support for one of these two models when they're compared to each other. And you'll notice that in most cases, overwhelmingly larger percentages of genes support the covariant model than support our sort of standard GTR plus I plus G models. And so to us, this was strong evidence that we're capturing something important about many of the the evolutionary processes that are generating these data sets. So beyond just simply asking if the model fit better, we wanted to know if it actually gave us different estimates of the tree, or if it affected the amount of support we were uh, assigning to the tree. And so each of these points represents a different branch uh, for these data sets. And along the x-axis of each plot, we have the probability of that branch assigned by the GTR plus I plus G model. And on the y-axis, we have the probability assigned by the covariant model. And you'll notice that uh, far from being a simple one-to-one, -one, nice tight correlations, we actually have quite a lot of scatter. And notably, if we look in the corners, we see some branches where we assign essentially zero support under one model, but we assign very strong support under another. And so I think this is, is telling us that these can actually change the answers we're getting back in meaningful ways. So lastly, uh, we've been interested in looking for outlier genes. And so we were motivated in particular by this question of where turtles go and the amniote tree. And so we were uh, using a collection of six empirical phylogenomic data sets. 
If you analyze three of them, you get one pla placement of turtles in the amniotic tree. If you analyze the other three, you get a different placement. So we were curious about why these differ. So we started digging into one of these uh, a little bit more. And what we did is for every gene in this data set, we calculated the base factor. And this gives us a measure of the strength of support, the phylogenetic signal in each of those genes. So base factor is simply a ratio of two likelihoods. And because we're doing this in a Bayesian framework, these are marginal likelihoods. So we calculate the marginal likelihood of those trees that contain some branch or some placement of turtles in this case, and then the marginal likelihood of those trees that don't contain, or that have turtles in a different place in the tree. We calculate the ratio of these two, and that gives us a base factor. So this measures the strength of the signal in a fairly continuous way. And so we were looking at this data set generated by Chiari et al. And as we plotted the distribution of these base factor values, where zero here represents essentially ambiguity, the gene can't distinguish among the possible placements of turtles. Uh, points below the line reject that possible placement of turtles. Uh, parts of these violin plots above the line represent uh, strong support for a particular placement of turtles. And so in the middle, you'll notice this croc-sister relationship. This is the relationship if you analyze the data in a concatenated way as a whole. That's the placement that's supported. But we noticed, noticed this very long tail going up to very large base factor values. And so we decided to dig into these and ask what was going on. And it turns out there's two genes in this tail. So there's two genes that very strongly support uh, sister placement of turtles and crocodilians. We were at a bit of an advantage compared to the original authors because we now had more reference genomes that we could explore for these, these groups, the, the taxa in these groups. And so we simply blasted the sequences in this alignment against these reference genomes. Uh, long story short, there seem to be uh, gene duplicates um, in these alignments, and uh, unfortunately, they happen to sample turtles and crocodilians from one copy of these genes, and they sampled everybody else uh, from another copy. So these are actually paralogs. So if we look back at this overall data set, if you analyze the data set as a whole in a concatenated way, you get a posterior probability of one placing turtles, sister, and crocodilians. If you take out just those two genes, we still have 246 genes left but we get a very different answer for the place of turtles. We get turtles strongly supported as being sister to Argosaurus, so we play the birds and crocodilians together. So we started exploring whether or not similar patterns exist in other data sets, and it seems like they do. For one of these other data sets, if you remove the 1% of genes that strongly support turtles as sister to crocs, you get a similar flip when turtles become sister to Argosaurus. So we're still digging into why uh, these genes in these other data sets might show this pattern, but there seems to be a consistent trend here. And so I think, more broadly, the points I'm just trying to make here are that there's lots of opportunities for us to conduct phylogenomics in a more robust and creative way. And these are three sort of strategies that we've tried. There's many others. Um, but I hope this just encourages us all to think more creatively, maybe about the way we approach trying to, trying to generate phylogenetic trees from uh, genomic scale data sets. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge NSF for funding, um, LSU for funding and computational support. Um, and a series of collaborators who've been integral to a lot of these projects. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.